it says, let the word of Christ, rich as it dwells in you, in wisdom made perfect, instruct and admonish another. And the word instruct jumped out at me. And um, so you had a good direction with yours, but if you wanted to, you could go to catechetics. Yeah, yeah. They only have three minutes left. <laughs> so, uh, because catechetics means what? What's the word mean? Echo. Echo. Send the word out. Let it echo back. Let it come and back continuously. How many of you have been catechists? Well, just all of you, good. And how did you become a catechist? Hey, you. Yeah. Hey, you. Yeah. I need you. That's right. I got a seventh and eighth grade class. <laughs> yeah. Type of thing. Yep. You were invited to take part, right? Is that what they call it? Okay. <laughs> At least the pastor didn't say, you, I need you, see me after math. <laughs> but we all have a vocation as catechists, if you stop and think about it. Because as fathers in a family, you have a responsibility of passing the faith on to the children along with your wife. And so we all have a call to catechetics. And some of us, and in this case, all of us here have been called to catechetics by the church to teach whatever grade level that they were looking for a teacher for, be it adult ed, be it RCIA, be it 7th and 8th grade, or the high school, or whatever group it is. But we all have a calling, and some of us have a calling beyond our normal family relationship. And as deacons, you're going to take it one more step further, because your catechetical background is going to play into your homiletics. And you're going to be teaching <coughs> the entire group on that weekend. Whatever the gospel message is, as you've discerned it to be, <coughs> in the direction the Spirit has led you, you're in a teaching mode. So, you keep growing with that whole experience. And of course, all catechetics should lead us to who? Jesus. 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 He should be the central focus of our catechesis. Tonight I want to take a look at the person of the catechist in the first half of this session. And I want to take a look at the vocation first of all. And then we'll look at the qualities of a catechist. And then how to grow as a catechist. And Father Hayter has given us some ideas and thoughts of how to continue that process of growing in his book, Common Sense Catechesis. And then the last piece before break, we'll take a look at trusting the spirit. Okay, 
The gift of faith, alive in the church and in your heart. In this video, you'll be dropping in on key moments shared by a small group of catechists as they reflect on the personal dimensions of their ministry. Let's join catechists Dennis Corbin, Lisa Malik, Mary Lynn Mahoney, Maleli Oropesa, Stan Crowley, and Master Catechist Facilitator, Sister Eva Marie Loomis, as their session begins with a discussion of their vocation as catechists. The reading today is from 1 Peter. Put your gifts at the service of one another, each in the measure he has received. The one who speaks is to deliver God's message. The one who serves is to do it with the strength provided by God. Thus, in all of you, God is to be glorified through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless our undertaking here today. Keep us focused on the reason for our gathering, to give honor to God in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As you know, we're going to be discussing the person of the catechist, and we want to focus on four primary considerations with regard to that. We want to uh, address the vocation of the catechist, the characteristics of the catechist, the importance of growing as a catechist, and of course the need for us to trust the spirit and the ministry that we do uh, as catechists. Uh, maybe you could say something about why you said yes uh, to the call to be a catechist. I said yes because it was fun. Uh, we, we were in a family learning situation where we also brought potluck suppers, our children played, um, we did uh, acting outs of the uh, Gospels, um, discussions in grade level groups. It was just fun. When we uh, moved to, to our parish, uh, I had come from another area where they did not have an inclusion <coughs> program. I have a special needs daughter, so uh, <coughs> when she was welcomed into this parish so openly and so willingly, it was to me just a natural thing that I would want to give back again. So it was easy to say yes uh, at that point. How can you say no when they've done such a great job of including your family into their home? When I went through the RCIA program when I joined the church some years ago, my sponsors asked me what I would like to do. I said, well, how about, how about being a Sunday school teacher? Presbyterians call it Sunday school teacher. So I, I went to the sister who ran the religious education program and said, I'd like to, like to help out. She said, we have a 10th grade class that can use your service. So my wife and I, I talked her into it at the time to, to help teach the class. Well, I wasn't about to do it myself. <laughs> She's a cradle Catholic, not me. So. I got to know the sister that was a principal there in the uh, elementary school, and I was trying to go back to school to, to get education courses because I, I really love teaching, you know, it's that, that satisfaction that I feel. And uh, she just walked up to me one, one day and she said, Malili, have, have you ever thought of being a teacher? And I, I looked at her and I thought, where is this coming from, <laughs> you know? Uh, God, are you talking to me? Or, I mean, it was just like it was all laid out for me. From my own uh, situation, I was in a, a child care worker at a, a children's home, and as part of the job, I was asked to lead the confirmation program, and I was afraid to say no. I thought it was part of the job description. <laughs> so, so there's a, lots of ways that you can get prompted by the Spirit to, uh, to follow the way of the Lord. But in, in terms of what a catechist actually does in terms of the practical task of the, the ministry of catechesis. I think that that's something that's so diverse and broad that we're being taught uh, what it means for us to grow into the ministry. 
I'd like to invite you to watch a short video reflection on the activities of a catechist and to invite you also to jot down a few notes as you watch the video. Notes in terms of what it is that you see catechists doing, but also additional insights that you may have in terms of the practical aspects of the ministry that we share. So what did you see? Right from the start, I saw <clears throat> catechists welcoming the kids. I like the physical involvement. There was the hand play, which was formal, but there was also the, the affection that was appropriate and warm. I mean, when the little girl was crying, I was ready to cry too. So consoling someone, sure. A lot of uh, emotional involvement with the person too, not just the teaching, but also being involved with the, the person themselves, because there's Spiritually, that is a need a lot of time. At a, time. a lot of multi-sensory, the puppets, the painting, the, the stories, um, small groups. Small groups, to be able to do that interaction that we obviously agree on that's important. Yeah. When I first started doing um, catechesis, it was brought home to me that um, being a catechist is different from being a teacher in that being a teacher, you're there to give something to everybody else in the classroom. But being a catechist, you're there to share and experience it. And that video really brought that home, how it wasn't just the children learning. It was the catechists themselves sharing and growing in the faith by their actions. That's right. And listening to what they're saying is important. I get as much out of what they're saying as I think they're getting out of what I'm saying more often than not. That's what I take away from the class or try to when I reflect on it after. But it takes listening. You have to listen to what they say and let them know that you're listening. We've agreed that what we're engaged in is an activity that really comes from the call of the Spirit and that it's one that's rooted in our baptism and it's also one that comes through a variety of people it's a call that comes in a variety of ways. It comes from children and their needs. It comes from the prompting of of catechists or other pastoral leaders in the parish. It comes from really reflecting on how to be more involved in the ongoing development of our children. It comes from a love of teaching and that activity itself. But it also places us, we understand this call, this, this movement of the Spirit in our lives, it places us in the company of many amazing men and women who, through the course of the 2,000 years of the church's history, have dedicated themselves to be sharers of the faith, to be persons who attempted to enliven the hearts of others, to welcome, to allow themselves to be instruments 
of the movement of the Spirit, to be instruments of the activity of the Lord. I'd like to invite you to watch a short video reflection that situates us within a broad spectrum of men and women who have dedicated themselves to do the things that we are doing throughout the course of the history of the church. But the wise shall shine brightly like the splendor of the firmament, and those who lead the many to justice shall be like the stars forever. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. The catechumen is a deserted inn, yet our master decreed this deserted, doorless inn should become a royal palace. He sent us, your teachers, to prepare the inn beforehand. St. John Chrysostom. When he says that he is the way, he is speaking the truth. If you follow this truth, you will have the life of grace and never die of hunger. For the word has himself become your food. St. Catherine of Siena. In the long run, is there any other way of handing on the gospel than by transmitting to another person one's personal experience of faith? Pope Paul VI. The initial criterion for any teacher is the criterion of taking care. Care is an attitude, a way of being toward the other, a decision in favor of reverence and respect. Maria Harris. At the core of catechist formation is the task of helping one another carry out the mission of being an image of Christ to the children we are to teach. Maria de la Cruz Aimez. To be a teacher is to be an instrument of God's grace in people's lives. Ultimately, teaching is God's own work. Remember then who the primary teacher is and ask for the help of God's Holy Spirit. Thomas Groom. What does this say to you personally in the ministry that you're engaged in? I feel very privileged to be um, included among people who go right back with a tradition of going right back to the to the gospels and if you go that far back and then you start the vocation of the catechist is rooted in our baptism comes from the community of faith grounded in a long tradition of catechists that makes us instruments of God's grace for others. And I like the fact that this video points out that a catechist is more than just a teacher. A teacher in front of a classroom can dispense information. And we can do that in, in, in CCD. We can dispense information. But the reality is catechist is much more. We're first called by our very baptism, but we're also called by the Holy Spirit to witness what we believe. And I say this to teachers in Catholic schools, and I say this to teachers in religious education, I say this to teachers in adult formation, it's one thing to teach, but if you live what you teach, they're going to buy it a lot quicker than if you just teach it, because they say, this is important to my catechists, so it should be important to me. So it's a process of not only proclaiming the word, but witnessing it in our own lives. And I think that's a key and an important factor to remember, to not only teach, but to witness what we believe. Let's take a look at the qualities of the catechist.
The National Directory for Catechesis reminds us that our work as catechists was modeled for us by Jesus Christ. Forming disciples, instructing them in the faith, praying with them, giving them a mission. In this segment, catechists explore certain qualities they will need in order to do this work. These qualities were first described for us by the 1979 National Catechetical Directory and are echoed in the 2006 Directory. The earlier Directory reminded us that it is the human and Christian qualities of catechists, more than their methods and tools, upon which the success of catechesis depends. Think for a moment about uh, persons who you have known in the ministry of catechesis that have impressed you very much in terms of who they are and, and what they have done. And then, if you will, just to, to jot down what you believe is among the most important characteristics or qualities that those persons have. My husband, and watching him work with teenagers, and the way he can listen to a teenager without being judgmental, and being open-minded and open-spirited. Somebody else, qualities that have touched you and impressed you. When I first joined the church, my first introduction to the religious was Sister Mary Bryan, a person of tremendous faith. But she came into our parish shortly after I did, and she took over the religious education. And as I had just become a Catholic and wanted to get involved, she grabbed me and said, you can do it. Her faith in me was much, much stronger than mine and myself. For me, the, the models in my life have been my grandmothers, um, who showed to me uh, a consistency about um, church attendance, about the need to pray. And now I find that my wife is in that role. She's the one who continually calls me back and, and our family back to pray all the time. It's like they are the Marys in my life. I am the Martha syndrome, um, always busy in the kitchen. And my wife is like the Mary who continually um, calls me back to being at the foot of Jesus, to, to listening to what he has to say, paying attention to what is really important. Thank you. Well, there are so many things that have been modeled for us. Listening, prayer, dedication. Uh, the ability to share, the ability to affirm people. It reminds us of the six qualities that the National Catechetical Directory has identified as important qualities for a catechist. These six are a response to a call, to be a witness to the gospel, to have a commitment to the church, to be a sharer in the community, to be a servant of the community, and to have knowledge, skills, and ability. I'll give you a chance to write those down. Response to a call, witness to the gospel, commitment to the church, share in the community, servant to the community, knowledge, skills, and abilities. What these six qualities keep us mindful of and what your own sharing and the catechists that we've viewed in the video keep us mindful of is that catechesis is about calling forth a community who has a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God, and who are participating in salvation history as they participate in human history, so that we continue the walk of those who have gone before us. We've asked two catechists to share with us their insights on these six qualities from the National Catechetical Directory. They are Mark Marcouli and Carol Ipers. And they are career catechists, they are experts in the field, and as they share with us what, how they understand the directory to be calling us to live our lives as well as to engage in our ministry, just to keep in mind that what they're advocating, what they're prescribing uh, for the ministry is something that we have to strive for all of our lives. A lot of times when I'm working with catechists and catechist formation, I will ask them, who called you to this ministry? And they tell the story of the DRE who stopped them on the way out of church or met them in the grocery store. And we talk about how that's how the call came, but that the call is really a call from Jesus. It's an expression of their very discipleship as Christians. You can study the, church's, the Catholic Church's tradition spiritual tradition and religious tradition without being personally touched 
by the information, by the mystery of the Hood's whole evolution and development. The catechist has to, and as the word catechesis means, uh, to echo, the way I like to look at it is that a catechist echoes in his or her soul the, the voice of God, the word of God. And it's in that echoing process through their soul that it can, can then find um, fertile ground in the soul of the, of the people that they're, that they're trying to share the message of the gospel with. Our creed, the statements of our beliefs, the teachings of the church are the effort of the faith community to preserve faithfully what it is that has been handed on. The doctrines that we proclaim, the creed that we proclaim each Sunday simply outlines the stories of the faith community and, and keeps us um, mindful of what is most essential in our life together as a faith community, what we want to hang on to in that mystery of, of God with us. I think for any catechist, they're working in a community environment. The work of their ministry is, is grounded in a community experience. People have to see you as being a sharer in the mystery of passing on the faith, and that's part of that whole echoing process, as I see it. Um, you echo back and forth, and you echo as equals, not as leader and subordinate. As disciples of Jesus, we look to the Last Supper where Jesus says, this is what it means to be a leader in the community, in this community of faith. It means you wash feet, that this is about service. Uh, so first of all, we are servants of the Lord. We are servants of the gospel. The gospel doesn't belong to us. Uh, we belong to it. The knowledge and skills uh, that a catechist needs are in service to his, her own relationship with the Lord. And very often uh, when people try to, um, to pit content against relationship, uh, I use the, the analogy of falling in love. And, and so I meet someone and I'm attracted to that person and immediately the first thing I want to do is to get to know more. And so I learn some facts, um, some things about this person's story. And that then feeds the relationship. And the love grows, the friendship grows, and then I want to know more. And so it's a cyclical kind of experience. Well, what impressed you from the comments of Mark and Carol about the qualities of the catechist? I really liked the image of echo. It, it was a consistent theme in all of the characteristics. And what appealed to me so much about that image is that with an echo, it travels great distances without ever losing the message. Mm. And I, I thought that was just very beautiful. And it just makes the gaps that we have in, in any one of our characteristics um, <laughs> that much more okay because the echo will flow over it and into the next area. I think one of the points that uh, stood out for me that, that Mark pointed out is the idea of being a witness to the gospel. That's what we really are. We are a witness. And I think this is one question a lot of times uh, when people are asked or invited to be in catechist, they don't feel qualified to be able to do this because they say, I haven't studied any religion courses, you know, how is it that I can proclaim this message? But I think that's a very important quality in a catechist, that it's a witness of, of the gospel to, to the children. To me, it's not only uh, an initial call that we receive to be involved as a catechist, but that call that continues to come especially when we are faced with a difficult situation, that problem kid, or um, how do we explain this particular tradition of the church or belief of the church to reach others? That is a call for renewal within me. That's when I have to go back and, and look again at what the church says, and I receive a new call, and, and my faith is deeper.
Did you ever think there was a response to the Holy Spirit when you got tabbed to be a catechist? I don't understand the question, Father. Do you ever think about it, that it was the Holy Spirit calling you rather than that DRE? And that's that little voice in your heart in the middle of the night that wakes you up. <laughs> But also comfort you. Yes. Because the Holy Spirit was working through that DRE or the priest or whoever it was that touched you to call you forth to be a catechist. The Holy Spirit was the one behind the picture. And then, of course, your yes comes from the prompting of the Holy Spirit after you've discerned it. And... The witness aspect, I think, is so important to remember. Uh, witness to the gospel and its way of life. How you live your gospel yourself, and then, of course, your own commitment to the church and its teachings, and then, of course, participating in the life and worship of the community. And then, of course, as you're called to be a catechist, you're called to be a servant to the community. And then, of course, your skills and knowledge that goes along with that. The National Directory for Catechesis reminds us that like all Christians, catechists are called to continual conversion and growth in their faith, and for this reason, are called to ongoing spiritual formation. Let's watch as our group of catechists discuss their own needs for continuing formation. It's really good to have this kind of exchange and gathering because uh, from all that we have seen and all that we have discussed, we get a real uh, insight into the fact that there's areas in which we can really feel sort of uh, affirmed in what it is that we are doing, but also we can identify areas in which we need to grow. I have several areas that I need to grow on. Um, I need to grow in being imaginative, also with storytelling. Um, I remember growing up as a child, I was always around my grandparents who were good storytellers, particularly my grandfathers. But um, over the years, I seem to have lost some of that skill that I was developing from them. And I think that's one area that my students and the adults in our RCIA process would also benefit from um, if I were to become a better storyteller. I really like that. The storyteller. Um, you know, as a catechist, that, that is such an integral part of it. And, I, you know, you kind of forget with all that resource material out there, you know, using it, reading it. And I can remember starting off watching that book and following that book as closely as possible <laughs> just because I don't know what I'm doing. Help. I think knowledge kind of goes along with that, too. When, when I teach, I'm very animated and I try to get everybody really involved, but I'm not very confident that I really know <clears throat> the basis or, or, have a, if somebody asks me a real in-depth question that I'm going to be able to come up with the answer. So I think that's one area I need to work on. I think of the journey to, to Emmaus with, with Jesus and the disciples, you know, and those guys were learning constantly on their road, and it's not something that, that ended once they recognized Jesus with the breaking of the bread. I'm sure that that journeying continued with the rest of the community. So we have a long way to go. I feel excited and challenged about what we have discussed here today, yes. um, realizing that there's still a lot of growth to take place. It certainly is evident to us that being a catechist does engage us in an ongoing growth process, and it's, we might say that it's a process of ongoing conversion. And we have to understand that this process of conversion, this process of growth, kind of has a life of its own. It's slow, it, it can't be rushed, but it's very deliberate and it's very purposeful. But you stay on the journey. You, in fact, you're very pleased, you're very eager about staying on the journey because you have a glimpse of what the end can be. And on this journey, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we're not there alone. 
Not only do we have the companionship of other persons who are striving to do the same things that we are doing, who are striving to be the same way that we are, who are striving for the same kind of life that we have, we also have the companionship of a good and gracious God. A God whose word does not come back empty, a God who in fact does not abandon us on our journey. Let's watch a video of an interview with Don Boyd. Don is one of the first professional lay catechists in America, and his many insights have guided many catechists along the same journey that we are on. I decided to teach in the junior high area, and I was fascinated. And I finally discovered at the end of the year I had learned more about being a Catholic from the use of a modern textbook than I ever did through Baltimore Catechism. It enlivened my faith, it enlivened the faith of the family, and from then on I just decided that's what I was going to do. Uh, I would say that whenever I went to church on Sunday with family, we went strictly out of a sense of obligation, which we were taught. Uh, we would come home and life would go on as usual. There was no change in our person because we participated in that that was observable. It was once I got into the preparation of other people as well as myself, uh, I started to live that faith differently and my kids did as well. I started getting involved in justice issues, working with the farm workers, doing that kind of thing, which I had never done before. <clears throat> I started to have a concern for the poor, the Catholic worker, all of the elements that say this means what Eucharist is about, that I'm to go out and be Eucharist to others. And that took root in my life oh, 25 years ago at least, and I have gone on from then uh, living that life. To me, it is a definite vocation, in as much as the person who is walking the journey with other people, be they children or adults, has got to be a person of prayer. And their gathering always begins in this parish in prayer. And I think that the prayer builds them together as a firm community, supporting each other and walking the journey together. Every class isn't perfect. But together they work through the stumbling blocks and they come out and they do a very good job. And I think that they look at it as a vocation. They may teach only once a week. But if you ask them who they are, they would identify themselves readily in the parish community as a catechist. Uh, that speaks to their vocation. Uh, that they identify with that and they live that out and they're faithful to it. Have you guys come up with an idea? Some of the things that I find absolutely vital is a person who cares about kids at whatever level they think they want to teach. They really have to care about them. Uh, the second thing is I believe you have to make it come alive that you're a believer of what you're sharing because if you're not it isn't going to make sense so it's very important for you to be this person of faith, this person of prayer, this person who wants to give themselves to the church as a catechist. All of that comes together when you walk into that classroom. I believe the biggest problem we have is that we've always been afraid to meet people where they're at, whether that be a child or an adult. And I believe that if we meet them at the level they're coming from in faith, and we begin together to build upon that faith, it is appropriated. Faith doesn't have to be perfect, and in fact, faith isn't perfect for all of us at all times. You know, we do the best we can, and that's all a catechist is asked to do, the best that they can. With God's help, do the best that you can. So what stands out in your mind from the many things that Don shared with us? Are there ways in which he further affirmed qualities that you already possessed, or are there challenges that he gave to you in terms of areas in which you know that you still need to grow? There were a lot, a lot of points. Just a quick one. Are you a believer in what you say? The key word that hit me was the respect, respect for the children. We have a tendency as adults to think of them as cute little munchkins instead of the, the human beings that they are. And I've often been amazed and almost intimidated by the depth of their faith and their knowledge. And we can say the same thing in terms of persons who work with youth 
or who work with adults, that sometimes in terms of going into the catechists, we believe that we're bringing uh, the message, we're bringing the insight as opposed to calling forth in addition to what we share. What he said that really impacted on me was that faith isn't perfect. And I relate that so much to myself. Um, I'm reminded of the prayer of Archbishop Oscar Romero that um, we are not messiahs, we are only ministers. We are only workers in the vineyard and not the, the vine master ourselves. And um, Don Boyd brought that home to me when he said faith is not perfect, that we cannot do everything ourselves. We must depend on others in the community to assist us. And, and overall, we must pray. We must let the Spirit do the Spirit's work and not try to, to be everything for all people. And that community, I think, is important that he yes. pointed out. Yeah. I think you do have to have fun. You know, that you can have spirituality, you can be prayerful, but you can't forget to have fun. It causes or it allows for a level of interaction and intimacy among people that's not task oriented. And so in fact, you're not bringing a job to a person, but you're bringing yourself and receiving a person as they are in themselves. Right. I think that's an important, important point that you say about faith not being perfect. It, it, it sort of makes me feel a little better because at the beginning it was like, I'm not a perfect person, you know, why, why, how can I bring faith to these children? Because sometimes they have the idea, the teachers are perfect, the catechists are perfect, holy people, you know. And I think that's important that they need to see that we are regular people, human beings, you know, and that we can learn from a, one another and share that faith. I liked his phraseology when he said that I'm to be an Eucharist to others. It brings about this concept of a chain. Jesus was the first teacher, Jesus was the first catechist, and he connected with his, his disciples who became the links in the chain and has carried on over 2,000 years. And somehow, through some miraculous blessing, I have become a part of that chain too. This whole notion of being a link in the chain really points out, I think, that what Don expresses so well is that when we reflect on who we are as catechists, we're I'm not just talking about what we do, but we're talking about our identity as a member of a faith community. This is who we are. And so the notion of doing the work of justice as well as discussing the need for justice, the whole notion of being community as well as the notion of discussing community, of being a mentor as well as talking about the need to be available to other people. that struck me when I was listening to this um, and it strikes me each time when I hear it meet the people where they're at now that is so important because as individuals we're much further down the road than a lot of individuals that we are going to be catechizing um, and we need to meet them where they're at, which means at times, if we're working with an RCIA group, we're going to have to walk back there to pick them up where they're at and bring them forward. Um, and that's so important that I think we always need to remember it, that we meet the people where they're at. And, and sometimes what that does for us is reinforces our belief and our witness because in the process of going back we're going back over that material again in our minds and our hearts and so that whole process helps us grow as well <coughs> as those individuals that we're catechizing and then of course we need to call that forth the faith forth in our learners as we work with them any comments on anything that they said in that that piece there that struck you? I like the part where it says you can't do everything yourself as a catechesis. You depend on others. Your your DRE, your priest, your deacon, 
to help you make sure that if you have questions what you're teaching, you go to them and get their support to making sure you're bringing forward the right information. Yeah, that's a very good point. And hold on to that. Uh, because as you work as a deacon in a parish, you're going to encounter different people at different places along the way. And it's a process of continuing growth. It's not a magic moment that when you're ordained a permanent deacon, you've got it all. You've only begun <laughs> in the reality. And so you have to pick that up and you have to grow with it uh, yourself. And I think that's important. And what you said needs to be held on to. Any others? Jumped up at me was his comment about you had to make it fun. Um, just thinking back for myself, I, you know, I think you might try to make parts of it fun to keep interest, like say for uh, eighth graders. But for you yourself, I don't know how much fun I could say that I had like preparing lessons and doing the class. It was more that it was a worthwhile thing for me to be doing. You know, I don't know that I would call it the classic fun. And, and, and thinking about other things, you know, like say coming to these classes or stuff like that, I, I don't, you know, it might be a little deeper than fun. Yeah, how do you define fun? Are you, are you, yeah. are you sure it's fun or excitement? The excitement of the class is what, what carries. That's why I'm not sure if that fun is such a good descriptive word to use in this example. Okay, yeah. Excitement, I like. You get them excited about the faith. Maybe enjoyment, or, you know, because you can enjoy something because it was something worthwhile to do. <coughs> it still might not have been all that much fun, like, to do, but... It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not... You might have a game... And it might be fun, but if you're it's excited about what you're learning, it's a different context. It, I think it's more of you, you want to make it exciting for them that they want to come to class, that they want to learn and enjoy themselves while they're doing that so much and having fun, joke, joke. But right. that way, every week <coughs> they come to class, they know they're going to enjoy it, they're going to get something out of it, and it's not going to be... Boring. Yeah, boring. I'll, I'll, an hour and a half of uh, someone lecturing up in front of them, but involving them as they learn. I think you can go too far, maybe. But, you know, how worthwhile is it is all you do is you play a game or something. You know? No, and you got to you got to enrich it as well. Yeah. I I a, the last class that I that I taught, I had a mom come up to me. And that was just before we came into, it started all this. It came up to me and she said, I don't know what you're doing. She said, but last year, she said, I would have to threaten my daughter. I would have to, with the grounding and taking things away, to get her to go to class. And she says, now it's flip-flop. She, she's telling me, come on, we're going to be late. I don't want to be late. You know, so it's it's that excitement. that, that I think that's a that. better, a much better word to describe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's... Uh when I was up in New Salem as pastor up there, I had a parent call me about her son and wanted to know if he was going to religious ed. And I said, yes, he is. I, I see him down there every Wednesday night. And uh, she said, well, who paid his fee? And I said, I don't know. I presume you did. He says, well, I didn't pay it. And I said, well, I can find out for you. I can talk to the religious ed director and find out who took care of the fee. And um, so I talked with the religious ed director and he says, well, he paid it. And I said, oh, okay. I'll get back to mom and let her know. And I got back to her and she says, I can't believe 
that he paid the fee to go to class. What are you doing down there that's got him hooked? <laughs> and I said, well, you need to come and find out. Because <laughs> we have an adult program, too. <laughs> and the reality is that was just one instance of several others who put the money in themselves so they could come to that class on Wednesday nights. And it wasn't popcorn and movies and this kind of thing. It was actually instructions in the faith. And um, so it's quite interesting if you can get them hooked, whatever it is that the instructor does, the technique that they use to get them excited about it, they'll want to come back. They want to keep coming back. Um, and I think that's so critical as we work with the young people, especially today when they're drawn in umpteen different directions. Because there's so many things out there that are beckoning them to come. Um, it doesn't mean we're going to water down the doctrine, or it's going, it doesn't mean we're going to water down the teaching, but we're going to get them involved in what they're learning. When you get them involved, then they're going to hold on to it. And that's so critical and so crucial. All right, let's take a look at what the Spirit does. We began by speaking about the fact that who we are and what we do is because of the call of the Spirit, and the activity of the Spirit in our own lives, that what we do and who we are is very much rooted in our baptism and our commitment to be a disciple, our commitment to share the life of a disciple in a community that is striving to do the same things. Of course what that means then is that our lives have been changed by other people who have shared their faith, by other people who have engaged us in ways that have led us to know how important faith is for us. Let's take a few moments and listen to some more stories of how the Spirit moves in our lives. My grandmother, Ida Bell West Jefferson, probably had uh, the most influence on my spirituality, not just Christianity, but my spirituality, because her, her insistence by living, not so much her verbal insistence, but her insistence by the way that she lived refused to let me believe that there was not a God, okay? And not only just a God, but a God who had a purpose for her and for every other person that he created. It was the village, it was the community. We had people, uh, uh, deacons, ministers, uh, we had uh, ursers in our church, we just had uh, men and women of our community would stop me and uh, things that uh, I would be doing wrong would say, now, son, now you know you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, how would this look in the view of God? Uh, straighten your life. You know, those kinds of things. Diego Gonzalez Grande. Diego was my history teacher during high school for many, many years. And what really strikes me about him in terms of the influence he's had on my life is that as a history teacher, he taught us to love what happens to people, what happens to real people, what really happens to people, and to always be very critical about, you know, well, why did that happen, or what were they looking for? And I think the reason he was such an influence on me is because at the same time, I was teaching CCD to third graders, and I found myself wanting to give those third graders the same passion for what's happening in their lives. And those are the things that brought my own faith alive, both you know, as a Christian, but even my own faith alive as a teacher in getting other students to also think that maybe faith isn't just about dogma and about God somewhere up there, but very much about looking, about looking at our lives and what's going on. Well, I really identified with the gentleman who talked about the community spirit I don't think it was one person in my case that gave me the spirit, 
um, it was the community. I, I've heard that the spirit is a constant whisper in your life rather than a voice out of the blue. Yeah. <coughs> I, I think that's true because that's it happened. That's my experience. As we watched the video and as my fellow catechists gave the stories about a particular person or situation, I was trying to find one person to peg myself and I couldn't. The whisper is what it was. Maybe I should do this or maybe I should do that. And I didn't really realize it until I looked back and so well, maybe there was a reason for that. Maybe there was a spirit calling me to do that. And sometimes we, I think some of us were sometimes blind, that we're, we're not opening our eyes around us. We're only waiting from up there, you know, a burning bush or something. But we have to look ar around us, and, and I think that we will find out that God doesn't abandon us, that He is always with us, and He is always taking care of us. That's exactly right. And something we hadn't really said a whole lot about is when we go into any of these endeavors, whether it be catechists or whatever, we have to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm your servant. Yes. Let me do as you wish. Do as you'd like me to do. Just show me. It's not me who's going to do it. I'm not going to be a good catechist unless you show me how to do it. And no, no matter how long we've been in the ministry, there's still a need to rely again and to acknowledge the fact that we don't know uh, all that there is to know, to acknowledge the fact that we're still in need of the prompting of the Lord, to acknowledge the fact that we're still vulnerable in a given situation, to acknowledge the fact that there's still areas in which we need to grow. I think that's where the Spirit will take over sometimes when you're doing things with the Gospels, you know, you're listening to God's Word and try, how do I present this today? It's not coming to me and the little prayer asking for that whisper and I, it comes through, and the Spirit somehow guides you. And I... We've talked about a lot today. We have talked about the fact that our ministry is not just about doing things, but it's about becoming the kinds of persons who can reflect the message that we have good news. We've talked about the fact that we need to be persons who are very much connected to the community. We are trying to model for others a way of living their lives that is attentive to the presence and the activity of God. Thank you very, very much. Perhaps as we end our time together, that we could extend with each other a sign of peace.
father? Yes. The, the woman that kind of ran that group, she had letters after her name, SSS. Do you know what that she stands for? I don't know what SSS stands for. I'm going to have to look it up. It's her religious order, uh, and it's probably society of something. It's social service. Pardon? It, it, the society of social service. Oh. I don't know if they belong to a certain saint, but... Yeah, we had a couple more on here. Is it like a lay, like a lay kind of? Jason's going to Google it. It's a group that she's a member of, okay. and is basically social justice issues. There's what they're very active in. So, um, we can Google it and find out. Yeah, that's what Jason's doing social right now. Social workers and national association is the organizing group. And there is a, a group of sisters known as the SSS sisters. <laughs> three, three. So it could be a couple of them. Yeah. It could be uh, Catholic social workers or it could be the sisters. There are several groups of SSS. <coughs> See if yes, it seems there's a lay group and then the urges are possible left and then there's also the order of sisters. Yeah, there's a, a lot of religious orders today have a lay apostolates with them. And uh, they basically live the uh, order's vows in their life, but they're in active ministry in the church as a lay person or a married a couple. Um, we have we have several groups in the, in the Diocese of Kalamazoo. The one that comes to mind very quickly is the Order, Third Order of Francis, St. Francis. And they meet, uh, they were meeting, I'm not sure if they still are. Uh, I know they're still meeting, but they were meeting at St. Mary's. And, um, and I'm thinking they still meet there. But they're in a lay group that follows the order of St. Francis. And uh, you'll find that a lot. Uh, the SSJs also have um, the uh, lay order that takes their charism and puts it into their, their life experience. And so uh, you find that a lot today, uh, and it multiplies over and over again. Any questions on any of this? Uh, anything that you heard that struck you that you're going to hold on to? Or anything you want to throw away? <laughs> I'm probably the only one in the group that has, I'm probably the only one in the group that hasn't actually taught a you know, catechesis class. But it just strikes me as being so parallel to this you know, diaconate process. You know, we're called, not, not really us, we're called, we're called to be who we are first and foremost, you know, person with God, you know, as opposed to what we do. So there's, to me, I see a lot of, you know, similarities. So you see the parallel yeah. with the diaconate program right. as to the catechetical program. Yeah. That bottom line, we are completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. When I have to do a homily for this group, there are some times when I'll do their research, I'll look at other people's work, I'll look at books, and still I can't come up with a with with the start, you know, the, the first few sentences that, that starts the homily. And then all of a sudden I'll start typing and all of a, and those 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 thoughts materialize on the on the screen. And when I'm done with it, I thank the Holy Spirit because those weren't my words. I didn't know what I was typing until I read it. That's not me. That's really quite remarkable. The Holy Spirit is an individual that we kind of neglect in our faith journey. Um, when I was at St. Monica's, going down to the bedrooms, there was a painting of the of a ship being tossed upon the seas and uh, the maintenance man was repainting the rectory and came in and asked Father Van Hoof and I what should I do with this picture and Father Van Hoof said well it shouldn't hang in the hallway going down 
to uh, the bedrooms, we should put it where people can see it. And uh, so I said, why don't we put it over the fireplace in the living room? It fit nicely up there. And so, so that's where we had him put it. And then we hung a couple other pictures down that hallway. And uh, the pastor came in, Father Consani, came into the living room and said, where'd that picture come from? <laughs> and Father Van Hoof says, well, it's been here all the time. He's not in this room. He says, well, you've walked by it every night when you went down to your bedroom. <laughs> no, it wasn't hanging in the hallway going down to my bedroom. <laughs> And he said, Gordon, where'd it come from? And I said, it's from the hallway going down to the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> the picture we walked by all the time, it blended in, and we never take, took notice of it. But you took and put it in another place, then it becomes new, and it becomes active in your mind. Well, that's the same thing with the Holy Spirit that's at work in our lives. He's working there every day. And as the analogy in this video said, it, from the, the one lady, it, it's a whisper that's always there. But we don't notice it. And a lot of times we don't acknowledge it. Um, and we should actually say thank you, as you did, uh, for giving me that enlightenment. Because... The Holy Spirit is very much active in whatever we do, whatever vocation we're in, whatever ministry we're serving in in the church. We didn't get there by ourselves. And Jesus told us that he wasn't going to leave us orphans. Jesus told us that he would send the paraclete. And he did. And he's always present to us. And we, at times when we get stuck, need to delve into that vault and let the Spirit come to us with whatever information and knowledge that needs to be conveyed at that time. Um, and I know myself in working on homilies, um, a lot of times I get stuck and I come to a roadblock. And that's the time I go to prayer and ask for the Holy Spirit to open the door. Where do you want this to go? What is the word you want proclaimed? And it comes through. It's there. Um, so prayer is a very important part of the catechetical ministry. It's also a very important part of our ministry as permanent deacons and as priests. The time of prayer and taking that time for that prayer is so beneficial. Um, any other comments on, well, let's take a break, and uh, we will come back and go at it again.